Heidi Welch. I do the billing and um, coordination of the payment plans for the LASIK and the procedures that Dr. Sharmini Asha Balakrishnan does. She is our LASIK uh, physician. She does a lot of other medical cataract surgeries, um, anything, anything with the front of the eye. <laughs> anything not the retina. Anything not the back of the eye. So I'm going to let her kind of take over, explain what she does, work for magic, and then if you have any questions about the billing side, then I will answer those by you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to be very brief and kind of just go over the nuts and bolts of LASIK. Um, so the first thing would be, why do LASIK? Which would be that you have refractive error. So you're nearsighted or you're farsighted. In this picture, you can see a perfect eye, which not many people have. But in a perfect eye, whatever you're looking at is focused perfectly on the retina. But in people who are nearsighted or farsighted, and you can see that at the top, do I have a point now? Um, at the top, you see myopia, which is nearsightedness, which means that someone's focusing too much. So the image that they're trying to see actually ends up focused in front of the retina in, instead of on the retina. And in someone who's farsighted, they don't have enough focusing power. So the image that they're trying to see actually gets focused behind the retina. And in astigmatism, um, which many people in the world have, they actually have multiple directions in their cornea. So they're focusing light in different directions. And they're getting a blurred image. And you can see there are multiple points, both in front and behind the retina and in different places. So they just see a lot of distortion on top of the nearsightedness or the farsightedness. So the point of laser refractive surgery is to alter the shape of the cornea in order to correct this error, because your error is coming from a combination of your cornea and your lens. Um, and so in young people who don't have any problems in their lenses, we change the shape of the cornea to accommodate what they were born with. So you can see here, in the case of hyperopia, which is farsightedness, again, before they have a cornea that's kind of flat. It doesn't focus enough, and hence the image is behind the retina. Afterwards, we make it more curved. And you can see it's a little bit more curved. It has more focusing power. And it should land on the retina, so they don't need glasses anymore. With myopia, which is probably a little bit more common than hyperopia, um, we, and this is a picture of LASIK, but we'll go into that um, later. But someone gets treated, they had a cornea that was too steep. And therefore, they were focusing it too quickly. It was in front of the retina. With the laser, we flatten the cornea. They lose some of their focusing power, and the image ends up on the retina. So there are a couple different procedures that we can do when we do laser-assisted refractive surgery. Um, and the most common thing that everyone knows about is LASIK. Um, one that's less commonly known about, but we actually do about probably 50-50 of these, um, is PRK, which is called photorefractive keratectomy. And the difference between these two things is that in LASIK, you create a flap along the cornea. And you can see that here. We use a laser now. People used to use a blade that's kind of fallen out of favor at this point. Um, but we use a laser to create a corneal flap, which is then lifted. And then we apply laser treatment to the bed that's underneath. And then we replace the flap back. With PRK, in someone who perhaps doesn't want the flap done, we just remove the front surface of the cornea. So you can see superficial layer scraping. Then we actually treat. And then we sculpt the cornea according to what we need for farsightedness or nearsightedness. And then we actually place a bandaged contact lens over it um, and allow them to heal over. And usually in about 24 to 48 hours, that whole front, front surface of the cornea is healed. Um, and we remove that contact lens at about post-op day number five. Um, there are a lot of risks and benefits of LASIK and PRK. Obviously, the benefit would be being glasses-free, not needing glasses anymore. Someone who's very nearsighted probably has to throw on their glasses as soon as they wake up in order to see anything. After a procedure like this, they don't really need to do that anymore. But there are some risks of both of these procedures, and that's common to both of them. And that would the most common thing would be over and under correction. So sometimes patients might get a little bit overcorrected. They might have to get enhanced later. Um, they might get a little bit undercorrected if the treatment isn't just right, and so we can treat them a little bit more. The other things that kind of come along with this are when you're applying the laser. Sometimes that laser treatment could be a little bit decentered, which would kind of compromise your treatment. Um, and some of the things at the bottom are the surface issues that can happen with both of these procedures. With PRK, when you apply treatment to the surface of the cornea, you can actually develop haze over that first year uh, if you have too much sun exposure. And that haze is a little bit difficult to treat, though we do steroids for it sometimes. Sometimes you can actually do a laser treatment on top of that, um, what you already had, in order to make the haze go away. But that is a problem with PRK. Another problem with both of these procedures is that someone who has very fragile front surface of their cornea, fragile epithelium, may not be able to heal as quickly. Um, people who are severe diabetics may not be able to heal over as fast or may not be able to heal at all, in which case we have to do some extra procedures to help them do that. Um, the most common thing that you'll hear about in patients, especially with dry eye, 
is that the dry eye could actually get worse after LASIK. You can imagine if you're cutting a flap of the cornea, you have nerves all along your cornea, which is why it's so painful if someone gets a corneal scratch. So if you cut those nerves with the flap, uh, then people have dryness for a fairly long time, especially if they had baseline dryness. So that's another reason we don't like to do LASIK in patients who have severe dry eye. And the last thing would be infection, which is fairly uncommon, but it has been heard of. Um, but obviously, usually, your surgeon is doing everything possible to avoid that. So these are some of the things that you would notice um, for each individual procedure. Um, with LASIK, you can have flap problems. You can have wrinkles in the flap. Your flap could get dislocated. These are all rare, but they can occur. And those are the main differences between the two. Some patients might say, you know, I don't want to deal with this flap. I don't want to deal with all the complications coming with it. I just want the surface treatment, and they'll go for that. Um, and alternatively, some people say, well, I don't really feel like sitting around for a week waiting for my eye to heal. And with LASIK, day one, most people can drive. And they don't need glasses. They don't need anything. There's no discomfort. So they're very, very happy. And all these complications are fairly rare. So the next question would be, who's a candidate? Um, pretty much anyone who has refractive error is a candidate for refractive surgery. Um, as far as who can do laser surgery, we generally can go up to about 10 to 13 diopters of myopia. Um, I think the highest that I've done is 13 to 14 diopters um, in someone over 20. Um, and for PRK, we can do anywhere from four, plus four to minus eight. So about four diopters of farsightedness, up to eight diopters of nearsightedness. And we can also treat people with astigmatism. This, I think, is probably the most important slide in the whole thing, because you can find many people who will do LASIK for any patient. Um, what you need to find is the person who's going to tell you that you're not a candidate. So who's not a candidate? There are many, many things, but these are probably the most important things. People who have very, very high refractive error. That means that we have to remove too much tissue, sculpt too much cornea, and that's dangerous, and that you'll end up with a very thin cornea. So people with that much refractive error would probably be more candidates for what we call fake intraocular lenses. So we actually put lenses in the eye that would correct the refractive error. And they can still be glasses free, but they don't have the risk of that much laser treatment. People who have too thin corneas, same thing. If they start out with too thin corneas at baseline, they will not be able to have enough cornea afterwards to have a stable cornea. Um, people who have corneal ectasia disorders, this is like keratoconus, um, they are not candidates for this because you could worsen their disease. Um, the other thing that could happen is someone who doesn't have these problems at baseline but is at risk for it, if you do laser treatment on them, they could end up actually unmasking that disease and they could actually end up having problems. So it's very important that people have a lot of corneal imaging before they sign up for this. Moderate to severe dry eye is mainly a contraindication for LASIK. Um, we still do, in moderate dry eye, we will still do PRK. But if someone has really bad dry eyes, I'm not going to do laser. I could do intraocular surgery for them, but I wouldn't do laser surgery. And then some people on certain medications and with severe diabetes are probably not good candidates either. So what happens if someone comes into the clinic, they get a full eye exam. We check their refractive error. We do a lot of corneal imaging. Um, we'll check if they're how dry their corneas are, what procedure they might be eligible for. If they are eligible for one, we also check their corneal thickness. Evaluations for LASIK are free at the first visit. If someone signs up, then we do a preoperative visit to actually iron, iron out exactly what we're going to do. And that's where the payment begins. But if anyone wants to know if they're a candidate, that's free in my clinic at least. So Nicole is the boss of refractive surgery, and that's her number. She's over there. So if you call that number, you will skip all the switchboards, and you will get directly to the person who knows what she's talking about. Uh, and she would sign up anyone or anyone's patients for that evaluation. And Heidi is the queen of financing. And that's where I stop talking, because I don't know what I'm talking about when we talk about money. So here. Do you have any questions regarding the medical stuff before she has a seat or runs off to see a patient? No? OK. Anybody have questions about the financing part of it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, my sister had uh, eye surgery, and then about ten years later, she ended up having to wear cheaters. Mm -hmm. Is that common? Uh, how old was she when she first had refractive uh, surgery? Let's see, probably about mid forties. Usually, with my patients who are in their late thirties and in their early to mid forties, we have a very long discussion about what LASIK is going to do. If you have someone who, generally the people who are coming in for refractive surgery might be nearsighted. In which case, if they were moderately nearsighted, they had this great advantage where they could just take off their glasses and they could read. 
and they right. love that. The thing that they don't realize or sometimes that people don't emphasize to them is that once you do refractive surgery, you lose that edge. You don't get that anymore. And so it can either kind of hasten the development of needing readers or it can worsen it because, or just kind of brings it on faster. Um, there are some options for people kind of in, in that range where it's just starting to get enough that they, they need help with reading. You could do monovision with LASIK um, or PRK. Um, and sometimes we just treat one eye if they're kind of perfect in the other eye and they can be able to read with that. But if it's just the problem with reading, it would probably just be that she kind of lost a little bit of an edge um, or she just kind of saw it faster where she might have had an edge before. That being said, if she had other things going on like astigmatism and things like that, you kind of, it doesn't matter how nearsighted you are and how much edge you'd have with that because your astigmatism is probably affecting your vision anyway. So. So not everybody who has this eventually has to? No, it doesn't necessarily cause it. I think it just kind of brings on the development of it, which everyone's going to have as they get older and wiser. Um, it just kind of. If you're nearsighted now, up, not far away. Exactly, and if I treated you completely for your refractive error, then you probably you would definitely need readers. So, if someone like you came into my office, then I would probably say, you know, let's talk about the different options we have to make you glasses free at all distances. Right. And so, it might be monovision, it might be, it might be, you know, holding off on that and maybe doing intraocular surgery with lenses, like what we call a refractive lens exchange, which I often do for patients over like 50 who have that need. So. No problem. Okay. I will, I'm just going to tell you all how much it is. Um, like she said, we do the evaluation for free. We ask that you do call um, Nicole to schedule those because she is going to put you on the schedule where she needs to be able to and explain everything. That way you have enough time for your testing. Um, the LASIK and the PRK we do offer. Um, it's at the same cost. It's $1,950 an eye. However, if you mention um, about the lunch and learn today, we will offer you a 20% discount. Um, that includes the one year free enhancements. After the one year, then you get, um, it's $650 for the enhancement if you would need one. Um, she also does, like she said, the refractive lens exchange. Depending on the type of lens, we also have programs for that. Um, and that is usually, without the LASIK or the PRK, it's about $4,000 because it's not medically indicated. She does do surgery for, if you have a cataract already, it can do refractive lenses as well. And that, depending on which lens you need there or what type of treatment, that can range from $1,300 to um, $3,000 for that portion as well. If you mention that you were here today on the Lunch and Learn, we will offer the 20% discount. Um, insurance does not cover the LASIK or the PRK. Um, they will, if you have the cataract, they will um, cover the removal of the cataract, but they don't cover, if she does, she does a laser procedure, she also does a manual procedure. Um, so removal of the cataract by laser is not, the laser itself is not covered, and depending on what lens you want to be put back in, if it's a standard that's included in the cost, um, if she does one for um, the astigmatism or if she does one for presbyopia, those are not covered by insurance. So it really depends on what center we schedule you at, their cost, but it's, um, that's where the $1,300 and up to $3,000 can come into play. And before you make any decisions, I sit down with everyone, myself, or if I'm not available, then there is another um, billing specialist that sits down with you. We do have, um, some financing options. Um, we use care credit. So does the surgery center that we do all of these, um, that we do the cataract surgeries. They take this as well for their portion. So care credit is a great program. They usually have six, 12, 18 months, depending on how much you finance, up to 24 months interest free. So we really, for patients that cannot afford to pay for this all up front, we definitely recommend the care credit. We have a lot of patients take advantage of that. Any questions on the finance so part? The evaluation is free or? Uh... The evaluation is free. Any other questions? You can use your flex card, right? You can use your flex card. However, 
with the flexible spending, you, we cannot charge that till the day you actually have your procedure. Um, so normally, I would call you the day I would call you the day before, get your number, tell you that I'm going to lock it up, and then I would run it the day of the procedure after I know that you actually had the, you walked in the building <coughs> um, for the surgery. The HSAs, or we can do it as long as it's in the plan year, and we can run it the day before. We usually try to get payment at least two weeks prior, though. So we, with for the FSA and the HSA plans, we will work with you on that. Good question. This Any? is something my husband's interested in. Uh -huh. So would he come in and have it all done on the same day, or do you do one eye one day? One we do both. This is the one thing in all of ophthalmology that we do both eyes at once. Okay. So. For the LASIK and the PRK. Yeah. Um, the if he needed a cataract surgery or the refractive yeah. lens one replacement, then it's one at a time. So it's a, depending on what procedure you're wanting. I got a question for the doctor. How long does the eval take? Usually? The baseline eval? Mm -hmm. Nicole can probably give you a better sense of that than me. Anywhere from oh. a half hour to an hour. Oh, very good. For the initial evaluation. <laughs> There's quite a bit of testing that she does, right, right, and right, then right. I'll right. chat with patients, yeah. Where, where's the ad for the new value? Is it Lion Center? Yes, the Lion Center right over here on the corner of Floyd and Muhammad Ali is where we do mo most of our, actually all of our LASIK and refractive, because we have all the equipment that we need to do, all the scanning that we need to do of your eye. But she does have an office here and we have one on Dutchman's Parkway where she sees other medical patients for any cornea problem, any cataracts, any dry eye, routine eye exams. She does pretty much everything except for the back of the eye. Any other questions? When you talk about that lens replacement, are you talking about something that stays in there? Yes, it is yours for like life. A contact lens? But inside. Yeah, it's like it's the same implant that we use in cataract surgery, except the, the only difference between the two is that presumably someone has a clear lens if it's a refractive lens exchange. But there are plenty of people who, you know, they say, my refractive error is too much. I'm tired of needing glasses for computer and iPad and iPhone and this and that. And so they want, they would just want to go with the refractive lens exchange. Can you want to show her a picture where it would go? Just maybe she should. And those are best for the people who are near side or far side? Either. Either one? Yeah. Basically, we take out your lens and put in a new one right, right where it was to begin with. And it's yours for life, uh, unless you don't like it, in which case uh, we can exchange some, some people. I, I exchange them if people don't like them. But most people are pretty what happy with them. What would they not like about uh, Multifocal lenses sometimes can have glare and halos. Um, and it takes a little bit of adjustment. Um, and so. I usually sit down and explain everything that's going to come and make sure that people are really on board. But sometimes if people aren't fully informed, they expected something completely different. Yeah. Um, but most multifocal patients, if they're the right ones, are very happy. So. Yes. We get patients from um, some outside physicians that maybe the patient wasn't fully informed of the lens they picked, and she will help them choose the proper one. So they're happy. Any other questions? No? All right.